Good morning, good afternoon, uh, good evening, depending on where you are online. Welcome to this session today on accountability to affected populations, a leadership commitment. My name is Manisha Thomas, and it is my pleasure to be the facilitator of this high-level panel today. And we've got a great lineup for you. I'd like to welcome you to what is the third event on accountability to affected populations during HNPW. We had two last week. This is the third one, and we will have a fourth one next week. So we look forward to seeing you at that one, and I'll tell you about that at the end. And this session today is really drawing upon the previous two sessions that we organized, and we're really going to focus today on humanitarian leadership, which was an issue that came out as a necessity for AAP to work well in our last two sessions, as well as a number of webinars that were done in the second half of last year. So really, we're looking at now this key element of making accountability to populations work, which is the, the need for leadership to really be engaged and making sure that leadership understands the importance of people putting people at the center of what we're doing in terms of humanitarian response. And in the recent interagency standing committee principal statement on accountability to affected populations, it really acknowledged this need for leadership and that said to make AAP a reality and to address the asymmetry of power that currently defines the relationship between humanitarian agencies and affected people, we really need to have that leadership focusing on AAP. And with that, it is my pleasure to introduce our panelists today. To my left, we've got Fasiti Soko, who is the director of the National Disaster Management Office in Fiji. Welcome, Fasiti. Online, we have Mark Cutts, who is above me, kind of like the Wizard of Oz. He will be speaking down below us, onto us. Uh, Mark is the Deputy Regional Humanitarian Coordinator for the Syria Crisis. To my far right, I've got Aisha Hassan, who is the Associate Regional Director for Community World Service Asia. To my far left, we've got Aliosha Donofrio, who is the Vice President and Head of Technical Excellence at the International Rescue Committee. And last but not least, we've got Charles Antoine Hoffman to my right, who is Chief of Section of a Chief of Section AAP in UNICEF. So thank you to all of you today for joining us for this panel. And we're really hoping to hear from all of you about your experiences in terms of ensuring that people and communities are really at the center of humanitarian action, as well as to reflect a little bit on what the IASC principle statement is going to be changing and what that recently launched statement, how is it being put into practice? What needs to change? What are the things to come that we'll be hearing about that? And we're also gonna hear about some of the challenges that you face as leadership, but also what are some of the commitments that you as leaders have been making in order to make sure that accountability to affected populations becomes a reality. Before we start hearing from the panel um, on their experiences in the different contexts from which they've come, I'm gonna to turn to you, Charles Antoine, to tell us a little bit about what we've discussed in the previous sessions, but also what does it mean, this IASC principle statement for anyone who doesn't know what it is? Tell us a little bit about it, please. Thank you very much, uh, Manisha, and, and a great pleasure to, to be here. Nice to see many uh, familiar faces in the room or online. And I also apologize for those who were at the opening session because I, I will cover slightly similar ground, but I, I'll keep it brief. Uh, I thought that would be good indeed to, to go back to the briefly to the earlier sessions. We had flagged up some of the, the, the key points that came up, but also maybe go a little bit back in time and, and reflect on the, the work we've been doing as part of the Humanitarian Networks and Partnership Week, uh, focusing on accountability to affected populations uh, since 2018, uh, because that's been an ongoing um, series of, of discussions on some actions, etc. And I think that there are some key elements that are coming through these discussions, which are worth putting on the table, so to speak. And this is work we've done in partnership with the IFRC, with OCHA, with CEDAC Network, CHS Alliance, and several other UN agencies and NGOs. So it's a collaborative effort. Uh, again, we've, we've been uh, doing over the, the, the last four years. Some of the common elements that have come through these uh, events um, are important to, to flag up. One is, is clearly the importance of collective approaches to AAP. That's something that has been probably not a big surprise because that was the subject of our discussion, but I think that this has been reinforced over the years. 
But more than, than that, there's been definitely a recognition that uh, we need, as a humanitarian sector, to have much more systematic, coordinated, uh, unpredictable approaches. Uh, and there's been a number of efforts around that. Uh, the jury is still out in terms of how successful we've been. Uh, I won't comment. Uh, I guess our panelists uh, and friends will, will uh, cover that uh, in a few minutes. Uh, but needless to say, there is a lot more that uh, remains to be done. We also wanted to have some evidence in terms of where we are. So last year, we launched, uh, in collaboration with ODI, the Humanitarian Policy Group, we launched uh, at the meeting here uh, a series of reports uh, based on case studies in different countries, DRC, Mozambique, uh, Central Africa, Indonesia, Yemen, uh, which was really good in terms of Again, checking where we are, but coming up with some concrete uh, suggestions, recommendations. Across all of that, the key theme has been uh, the importance of leadership and leadership engagement. Uh, and this is also why we, we wanted to, to zoom into these aspects, uh, particularly uh, this year and for this session today. And maybe just briefly going back to the IEC principle statement, uh, which uh, most of you will have, hopefully will have heard or will read after this session, um, because I, th I think that, you know, a sarcastic, sarcastic view could be to look at it as, you know, yet another set of commitments, yet another paper. But I think it gives a lot of weight in terms of some of these very important, uh, not only commitments, but changes that need, need to happen uh, in the humanitarian sector. And I, I think that there's a clear call in, in this document uh, to shift towards a situation where this is a decision-making power is in the hands of aff affected communities or affected people. And there's a long way to go in my view, but, but again, I think this is clearly setting the, the, the direction. And to finish off, uh, not all of you will be familiar with the Interagency Standing Committee and, and this gathering is definitely meant to be much broader than that, but some of our discussions refer to, to, to this uh, particular um, group. Um, there's a number of things that will be put in place in the coming months with the AAP Task Force, which is co-chaired by the IFRC, WFP and CHS Alliance. Some colleagues are in the room, so if there are questions, I'm sure they would be happy to answer. But again, it's a matter of taking those commitments uh, to, to, to the next level and, and uh, making them happen at country level. Um, I leave it here, Manisha. Super, thanks so much, Charles Antoine, for that overview. And I think that point that you raised about having those collective approaches being important is something that has definitely been highlighted in the various events that we've had. And I think that and all of those elements, the point of leadership was highlighted as being incredibly important if you want those collective approaches to work. So I think it's very timely for us to have this panel with a number of leaders who can tell us how they've been able to support those collective approaches as well. Fasiti, I'm going to turn to you first, if I may. From your experience as director of the National Disaster Management Office in Fiji, can you tell us how you've ensured that communities are at the center of what you're doing? Bulavanak, everybody, and thank you for that question. Um, there's quite, a, you know, the question is quite, covers a lot of areas, but I'll narrow it down to three main components. The first one is the importance of emergency structure. Uh, for Fiji, we are fortunate that we have a structure that are in place that is bottom-up approach. In our emergency structure, apart from the uh, senior government officials that makes decisions during critical times, we have two members that are not government official, and this is Red Cross, and Fiji Council of Social Services, which is a representative of all NGOs in Fiji. So these two main um, members into our council brings that community aspect into our decision-making. Um, so one is the emergency structure. Two is the importance of policies and training. I can't emphasize that enough. Yes, you will have a lot of uh, communities that are affected, that you go in and you support them in your system. But it's not until you mandate those level and those type of assistance into a policy that will really put action into those uh, activities. Now, for Fiji NDMO, for the Fijian government, there's a few pol policies that we have uh, developed uh, on the agenda of community focus. One being the, uh, the development of standardizing community-based disaster risk training manual. This manual enables any practitioners in Fiji to, you, uh, to 
to conduct any uh, to conduct training to communities irrespective of their geographical location where methodology uh, and key messages are disseminated to communities who are usually our first respondent. Uh, the other one that we are currently developing is our disaster volunteer manual uh, that is still in a draft form, but it's all coming out of after action review. Usually for the Fijian government, after any disaster, we conduct an after action review to gain what uh, what what we did well and what we didn't do well. So the CBDRM training manual came out of uh, a lesson learned from a Category Five cyclone that hit Fiji and one was and was recorded as the uh, the most catastrophic cyclone in the southern hemisphere in the Pacific. So of that born the CBDRM training manual so that communities are trained the same way when it comes to emergency response. Um, and then finally. Uh, precipitary approach, very important to engage with the communities. The communities are our first responders. I always say that they are the first one that will be out and about looking for victims or looking for those that have been affected. Uh, and therefore, training those very young ones or training those ones uh, on how to respond to any disaster. And I'll give one probably ex one example um, an island that is very far from, uh, very Location wise, it's it's easier for them to go to Tonga than to come to our capital of Suva. Um, and this particular island, because of the community engagement and the training that we have done uh, as government officials, in an event of a disaster, the teachers are the ones that goes around with the youths in the village to collect vulnerable uh, members of society. So we're looking at the elderly, the disability, uh, the, these, the vulnerable ones are then moved first to the evacuation center to ensure their safety. Uh, these are some of the measures uh, that we have in place that we are working with our partners, including our CSOs and NGOs um, to ensure that no life is lost, but most importantly, having the focus around community uh, and their involvement during a response. Thanks very much, Fasiti, and I think that point that you made around how you're doing those after action reviews to constantly learn about what you could be doing better and really applying those lessons is an incredible one. And I think we often do evaluations in our humanitarian community, but we don't necessarily pick up on the lessons identified. So it's great to see that you're really doing that and a good lesson for the rest of us to, to pick up on. And, and that point around also how you've got the teachers on the island really identifying those who are most at risk I think is incredibly important as well, because if we're figuring out how do we identify those who are most vulnerable or who are most marginalized and aren't easy to get to often in a response, that's also an incredibly important point for making sure that we're responding to them. On another point, you know, what are what is some of the coordination you've put in place with partners and what have been some of the challenges or opportunities that you've come across in those partnerships? Thank you. Um, again, there's quite a lot done in that space as well, but I'd like to just highlight a few. Um, the Fiji Council of Social Services, which is the NGO, uh, the head of the NGOs in Fiji, uh, we worked with them with regards to uh, developing two key documents. One is localization. Uh, we, we, we promote localization. Uh, we want to encourage localization mainly for the idea of mainstreaming um, response in a way that will enable uh, those communities that are affected to understand the principles of response. The second one that we worked very closely with is the, uh, the Code of Conduct for Civil, uh, for civil Society Organization. Uh, this is an ongoing initiative that we have with FCOS, uh, and then we have partners such as CDAC, uh, Fiji, uh, replicated the Fiji the uh, cluster system that the UN has. We've contextualized that to Fiji, and we've and we've called it the Fiji cluster system, which has nine clusters. Of that, we have the communication cluster, which is headed by the Ministry of Communication and. Um, and the uh, community engagement is co-led by CDAC. Uh, so CDAC has been very supportive with regards to communications to be disseminated in a very layman's language uh, to communities. So this was very useful in the 2020 tropical cyclone Yasa, which is again another category five. Uh, and then two weeks after we got hit by category five cyclone, we were hit again by another category two, which is Anna. Uh, and then while we were still responding to that, we had a lockdown because of COVID. And all these disasters that we were responding to 
key messages to communities very critical and therefore working with our partners to disseminate the information down to the public saves lives. Thank you. Thanks very much. And I think that point about kind of simple communication is also critical because oftentimes in the humanitarian community, we have lots of acronyms and lots of terminology that don't make sense to many other people outside of our, our forum. So I think it's great that you've been able to have that kind of communication and working with partners. So thank you for that. I'm going to next turn to you, Mark. Um, no, sorry, I, 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 I'm wrong. I'm going to turn to Aisha first. Sorry. I'm not reading fast enough. Um, Aisha, in, in light of the recent IAC principles statement that Charles Antoine was talking about earlier on AAP, it, which clearly states that an accountable humanitarian system is one where decision-making power is in the hands of those affected by crisis. From your own experience, have you seen much progress in terms of shifting this power? Um, thanks, Manisha, and hello, everyone. Um, yes, if we compare it like uh, from previous years, there is definitely progress. In communities, if we see now the response or the work, it, the communities are much more engaged in all of the project cycle management, whether it be design or implementation or even afterwards. Then we also see like there is a lot more coordination between various stakeholders, be it NGOs and different government authorities. And it is very encouraging to see that in many places now, like feedback mechanism, complaint response mechanisms, and such other systems are in place. Um, however, having said that, uh, still I feel that there is a, a long way to go. Uh, and effort is still needed to have uh, and to support more localized response. And there is a need to empower local structures, local organizations, so that they can respond to emergencies or they are the first ones um, to work in their area. Uh, understanding field realities and responding to them, uh, keeping in mind the context and what is possible is also, I think, very important. And this area still needs uh, some more attention. Like, for example, uh, from donor's point of view, uh, like uh, if I'm now here, I'm talking more from an implementation point of view, implementation agency's point of view. Like from donor's point of view, for example, there is a lot of emphasis on having referral mechanisms in place. Like for example, in case of child protection or in case of GBV, there is a lot of emphasis to have referrals. Whereas in our context, in our situations, a referral system doesn't exist. So these kind of realities, we also feel that like should be uh, the, in, in place in order to enhance accountability. Thanks, Manisha. Thanks very much, Aisha. And I, I think that point around donors really pushing us to do things that may not reflect what is the reality is something that is a constant challenge, I think, because there's, you know, what they'd like to have or what we'd like to have in the humanitarian system isn't always necessarily so easy to put in place in every context. And building up towards those is one of those elements. But that that does take some time for sure. Um, as a leader in your organization, what are some of the, the shifts that you've put in place to kind of really put people at the center? Sure. Like I would like to share some examples which works well in our context, in our uh, case. Uh, various quality and accountability standards, whether it be sphere, whether it be core humanitarian standard or any other standard, uh, I really feel that like application of it, following uh, these standards in our area of work, it has really added value and, and brought like accountability. And then, as I was saying, like empowering local structures uh, has worked very well. It not only gives confidence to the communities, uh, but it, 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 it brings like sustainability to our work as well. Um, then acting on feedback, having such mechanisms in place to receive regular feedback, regular complaints from the communities, responding to them in time, addressing their uh, complaints in timely manner. I think this is also the key to accountability, commitment of leadership, no doubt, definitely it should be there. 
then advocacy and application of quality and accountability standards not only in one's organizations but promoting it and building capacity of other actors whether it be government authorities or ngos working in that area i think it also enhances accountability and creates a, a, such a culture in which like everyone feels to contribute towards it thanks Thanks very much, Aisha. And I think that really looking at the, how you're being able to implement those standards to really put into practice AAP is really encouraging to hear. But I think that kind of getting others on board as well and helping them to understand is also going to be critical as well. Mark, now I'm going to turn to you, Mark. Um, with the recent efforts within the ISC to ensure that AAP commitments are supported by leadership at country level, what are some of the steps you've taken with the leadership within the leadership of the humanitarian liaison group to make sure this becomes a reality. And maybe you can just tell us a little bit about what the humanitarian liaison group is for those that may not be Syria experts, please. Mark. Thanks Manisha, and, and it's a real pleasure to be with uh, all of you for this session today. Um, so I'm working in this Syria operation, as you know, this is a, a massive aid operation, and I'm responsible for coordination in the opposition controlled areas in, in Northwest Syria. So um, our group is not called the humanitarian country team because you normally have one humanitarian country team for the whole country and that's in Damascus. But since I cover the, the, the opposition controlled areas of the Northwest, uh, we call our coordination team, the humanitarian liaison group. Now, um, some of the things that we've done is, first of all, to try to have more Syrians involved in the decision making. Um, you know, a lot of the aid comes from uh, big UN agencies, it comes from donors, it comes from um, uh, international NGOs. And uh, a few years ago, when I arrived here, um, we had a, a leadership team, a coordination group, um, which was about 80% foreigners and only 20% Syrians. So we have uh, changed that. And today we are almost um, at 50%. And um, uh, we have now, you know, agreed to 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 to, to include some new members. So, um, by uh, you know, by the next meeting we have in a month from now, uh, we will have a membership which has um, at least fifty percent of them will be Syrians, uh, because we saw this as a as a real problem that uh, you know we're we're. we're we're there to serve Syrians, we're working with Syrians, and yet most of those in the coordination and leadership team were non-Syrians. The other thing is that, as you know, the majority of the people that we support are women and children. And we also had a very male-dominated team. Now, this is not just particular to our operation. I think in, you know, throughout the Middle East, but also in many other countries around the world, many of these um, humanitarian leadership teams tend to be very male dominated. It was particularly the case in, um, in our operation here, because um, almost all of the Syrian uh, local NGOs were um, headed by men. Um, the UN agencies, I'm afraid they did not set a good standard themselves. Even today, we have um, <clears throat> 10 UN heads and nine of them are men. Uh, can you believe it? It should not be that way uh, in, in, in the world today, but it is that way. And so um, we had a, a, um, <clears throat> a coordination group where um, the great majority of the people in the room, sometimes 90% of the people in the room, believe it or not, were men. So um, in my leadership role, I simply decided we will change that and we will have a hard and fast rule that there will be a, uh, a coordination team which will have 50% uh, women and 50% men. And that's what we have today. I've just come from uh, a meeting of that group right now. And, and it's a very different kind of meeting, I can assure you. Um, uh, the, a lot of the women um, in, our, in, our, in our team, you know, Syrian women, they ask for different kind of issues to be on the agenda um, of our meetings. So we have very different kinds of discussions. Uh, the other thing we've done is to try to ensure that we have much more participation of uh, affected people directly in our uh, coordination meetings. So today, for example, the meeting I've just come, come from, we had uh, colleagues um, <coughs> um, uh, joining us from Idlib, from Northwest Syria, 
joining us online. The other thing we've done is give a lot of focus to things like um, the, the languages that we use. Um, all of our meetings are in both English and Arabic. That did not used to be the case, but we have interpretation services. We have a very, very good interpreter. We have the equipment that is needed and people can participate both in English and Arabic. So these are some of the steps that we've taken. Uh, we also had a workshop recently. Um, we produced an action plan. Uh, we did not call it an AAP action plan because I personally hate the acronym and the acronym does not translate very well into Arabic or into many other languages. So our action plan is called an action plan for change. And it has 10 points. I don't think I have time to go through all of those 10 points now, but, you know, it's all about, you know, including um, people with, with, with disabilities in our discussions, having much stronger participation at every level. And of course, all of what we're doing is not just about our, our main coordination body. We're trying to ensure that this is replicated throughout all the clusters and all our working groups and throughout everything we do. Of course, that takes time, but in my leadership role, I have wanted to set the tone. So that's the way uh, we, we, um, we run things in our main coordination body. Thanks very much, Mark. And you actually preempted a question that it was in the chat while you were speaking about what percent of Syrian women leaders are in the team. And actually, you said 50-50 men and women. So I, I will ask you actually to maybe reflect on how many of those are Syrians versus internationals. And I apologize to everyone in the room that I keep looking down, but I'm watching the chat and the Q&A. So it's not that I'm ignoring you. I will look up and find you if you've got questions. But maybe, Mark, you can also tell us, I mean, you've been around in the humanitarian community for a while. Um, as a seasoned humanitarian practitioner, do you think we're doing enough to live up to our commitments? And are we addressing the asymmetry of power between humanitarian agencies and affected people, as the ISC principle statement puts it? Or if we're not, what should we be doing more? Um, we are definitely not doing enough. I mean, we have a long way to go. I think the humanitarian system globally, and, and uh, including here in our Syria operation, is still very much a top-down system. It's still a very supply-driven system. And I think, you know, it's going to take a little bit of time, but we need to make much more effort. We need a much stronger commitment from, uh, from all of the leadership of um, all of the different agencies, whether they're UN or international NGOs or, or national NGOs. We all need to, to work together to really, um, you know, change the, the culture and the system of international response to humanitarian emergencies. I think over the last um, you know, few decades, um, it's been a very kind of neo-colonial system. You know, the, it, it's about foreigners who, who, who fly in the, the, the aid or they truck in the aid, they bring in the aid from outside, they bring a lot of foreign workers in from outside. Um, and it's as if you know, these international organizations are saving lives. Actually, the lives are saved by local communities and local civil society. We need to you know, really change the thinking and think much more in terms of we are there to support local communities. We are there to support local civil society, local organizations to provide um, the context specific responses that, that people in those areas need. Um, you know, I think we've, it, it's correct that the IASC has put a lot of emphasis on, on, uh, on localization, but we are certainly not there. I think we've still got a long way to go. Thanks, Mark. And, and do you know the percentage of the, in terms of the humanitarian liaison group, the percentage of Syrian women on the team? Well, um, as I, I don't have the exact figure in front of me, but um, half of the, uh, um, almost half of our team uh, are Syrians. And of the Syrians, um, I would imagine that at least half of them are women, actually. Um, I, I, we, we can get back to you with those figures, but it's, it's not as if the great majority of the Syrians in the team are men, I can assure you. We have a, a strong uh, women's uh, group. We, it's called the Women's Advisory Group. Um, they're, they're a very dynamic group. Um, you know, today they were, I just come from a meeting where they were presenting. They linked us up with women inside Idlib. Um, we have very different kind of conversations because we do have a lot of women. Uh, and, and, you know, we, you know, what we found, the, the other thing we did really is we made our coordination group is not about just about heads of agencies. 
Um, you know, there are a lot of women leaders. They might not be human, uh, uh, heads of their, their NGO. They might not be the heads of their organization, but they are leaders in their own right. There's, there was already a very dynamic group of, of Syrian um, leaders. And we've simply you know, made sure that they are part of our platform. This is not a, a male platform anymore. It's not a UN platform. It's not there for foreigners. It is a humanitarian team. And, uh, you know, I, and by the way, if we can do that here in the Syria operation, where um, you know, almost all of the, U, uh, the, 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 the heads of the organizations are men, and we have a leadership team which is 50% women, if we can do it here, we can do it in ev any uh, humanitarian country team around the world. And I'm surprised they haven't been doing it more. I think it should be a rule in every one of the teams. It should be a rule. It could be a rule, and it's very easy to do. If you want to know how to do it, you can talk to us. Um, it, it works extremely effectively here. Thanks very much, Mark. Um, and I think that point that you also made around AP being a, a difficult acronym to also, or difficult concept to translate into Arabic probably applies in many other languages. And uh, there's, I, I will be coming back to the questions in the chat for all of you, but there was a point in the chat around you know, whenever we call, we talk about accountability, it is understood in different ways by different development practitioners. So maybe we need to try to formulate a common definition so that across both humanitarian and development actors, we might be able to better understand. Um, thank you, Mark, for that. For that, I think it's great that you've also pushed for that 50-50 leadership and bringing in more national and local organizations, as well as that gender balance, which I think is important. And then, and the point also around your action plan for change, ensuring that you're including persons with disabilities or I assume other individuals of diverse, uh, of various diversities, I think is critical as well, because often we don't necessarily reach everyone in our humanitarian responses because we're looking for those who are easiest to see and or that we find more easily as opposed to really looking for those who may be harder to reach. So thanks for that, Mark. I'm going to come to you, Alyosha. From your own experience with the International Rescue Committee, how can we make sure that leadership commitments, like the ISC had commitments back in 2011 on AAP, they revised it in 2017, it's now been reinforced by an ISC principal statement this year, how do we make sure that those are acted upon and what, what is IRC doing to make sure that those are acted on and why does it seem so difficult to make some of those very much needed changes? Thanks, Manisha. And um, I guess, I am probably one of those cynics that uh, Charles Antoine was referring to at the beginning, who might be saying, why are we still talking about this thing? And I guess the, the answer to start with, why is it so difficult and a diagnosis of, of what's going on? Um, I mean, there is no, there's no end state here. There's no perfect state that we get to where somehow aid is accountable. Um, and so the reason we are still talking about it is, is rooted both in, its, in the difficulty of, of shifting power relations, but also in the fact that, you know, that there are, there's progress forwards, there's progress back, there's, uh, there's backsliding, there's, um, there is no sort of simple linear uh, path to being more accountable. This is about increasing the number of moments in which you are accountable and being more accountable in those moments rather than less accountable. So it's, it's um, at the risk of using another piece of jargon, it is a continuum and it's, it's about um, struggling to, to make progress on that continuum. So why, why is it difficult to make progress? I guess, you know, I'm coming at this from a perspective of working in a, in a large um, international NGO but whether you're in a large NGO or a small organization, whether you're uh, in a UN agency or whether you're in a, 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 a private contractor or a, or, a, um, or a government, generally speaking, what we're talking about is operating in um, highly decentralized contexts and operating in ways where um, the, you know, for very good reasons, the change agenda is a very crowded marketplace. Um, you know, we all want to do better on so many different axes. We want to use more evidence. We want to be more cost-effective. We want to use better data. We care about safeguarding. We care about anti-corruption measures. We care about safety and security of our staff and so on. So imagine what it feels like for a, um, 
for a leadership figure in a in a particular geography, be that a, a country, a, a field office, a, a region, or whatever. There are a lot of pressures all the time, and so to to keep the and I'm finally coming to AAP now to keep the the pressure on and to keep the the progress and to keep um, uh, making. Um, progress on this on this dimension it does require leadership it does require attention so what are we doing as a as a as an ingo um and what can we learn from that i guess the first thing I, i'd like to echo uh mark it's it, it's not just that aap is a horrible acronym in other languages it's a horrible acronym in english um and you know so i think one of the first things that's required of leadership is a simplicity and clarity of focus be clear about what it is you're talking about repeat key messages, get rid of the jargon, break it down, make it part of your culture. So, um, you know, in our case, we talk a lot about uh, listening and responding to our clients. Um, we use the word clients instead of beneficiaries. We can debate the pros and cons of that, but, um, you know, we, we are trying to, even in the use of the word, there's a signaling of trying to be responsible for providing a service to people. Um, and then, you know, living in a decentralized uh, culture, we need to chart a framework and chart a direction of travel, but we want people to own their own decisions. So it's also about giving people, giving our staff um, a, uh, an opportunity to make choices about where they want to invest and how they want to invest. So providing resources, providing an overall direction of travel, but not being very, very specific about um, what people do when. We want them to own their choices. We want to be able to hold them accountable uh, to making those choices. So specifically, what components are playing out? One much uh, neglected route to greater accountability is just in what we do. So I am a great fan of asking the question, can we just give people cash? Let them make choices, stop over-determining other people's choices, stop the whole kind of, we have to create a massive um, monitoring system around what we do. Let's just trust people and give people cash to make their choices about how they respond to their needs. So that's a first starting point that I definitely would encourage uh, people to adopt. Then in terms of um, other other strategies, we've we've uh, you know been influenced by ground truth solutions over the years. We definitely care very much about um, simple, rapid um, feedback loops, uh, gathering information, using it, bringing it into uh, project management routines, bringing it into conversations, management conversations uh, at all levels of the organization. Um, and we're pushing forward with trying to experiment with different ways to bring um, uh, more participative kind of design processes to, to program design. It's not, not easy. I mean, it's one of the most high pressure um, uh, time. Uh, time is a scarce commodity in, in design processes generally. Uh, so we're just trying to get better about understanding our own uh, rhythms and cycles and trying to actually get better at planning ahead of time. Uh, and, and taking the time and, uh, and creating space to bring people in and have those conversations that actually can lead to better design uh, in the first place. So I guess that the, the kind of overall message is there is no one path. There is no point that we'll, we should stop talking about this. I do think that the, the, um, the restatement of, of principles is, is uh, helpful. I, I don't think it's a silver bullet, but I'm you know both cynical and happy to be continuing to talk about these things. Thank you. Thanks very much, Alyosha. And I, I, I think that point about the simplicity of messages really echoes what Vasiki also said earlier, is that we may have our jargon, but for individuals to understand what we're talking about, we need to be clear, simple language. And I think that's a really important point in that, you know, repeating things over and over so that we understand it from leadership down so it gets across the organization is also really key. I mean, what do you think is the, ro the role that donors should be playing in this AAP arena? If we can come up with a better word for, instead of AAP, I'd be very happy as well. Um, but in this area so far, you know, what should donors be doing and what's your experience at, from uh, working with donors and what they're doing from IRC's perspective? Thanks. So I think 
donors are often held up as the excuse for why we can't do things. And I think that's totally unfair. And I think there's loads of stuff that you can do even with a very rigid funding instrument. Um, that said, greater flexibility in funding instruments is definitely helpful. Um, I think donors can usefully keep us honest and hold us accountable to, um, to these principles, to our principles. Um, I think that uh, done well account or, or exercised well, accountability to donors can be a powerful lever for change. Um, but I think it's also very easy for AAP to become a checkbox on, um, on, a, on a proposal checklist. I think it's very easy for um, organizations uh, of all shapes and sizes that are good at fundraising to know how to game the system. I think there are plenty of nice words and phrases that can be included in proposals that make it sound like there's accountability to effective populations. So I think, you know, if, if we really want donors to play a role in, in uh, holding our feet to the fire, then I would say, you know, build that into the way you interrogate. Well, for one thing, maybe read the, the reports you're getting. But, but if you do read them, um, you know, and if you do want to ask questions about them, ask questions about uh, how you've listened to and responded to um, feedback from, from uh, the people that this project is, is supposed to be reaching. Um, Ask those sorts of questions when you come on visit. Ask to be taken to a place where the project's not going very well and where you're trying to struggle to adapt to uh, what you're hearing about the, the problems with that project. Don't, um, don't use accountability to affected populations as some sort of stick to uh, punish us with, but really engage in a conversation about how we can do better. Uh, and insist on a, I would, I would say, you know, in terms of, in budgetary terms, I would insist on some sort of flexible contingency line as a, as an absolute prerequisite that's ring fenced and that is used in the course of the program to respond to what you're hearing from, uh, from the people that you're serving. No design is perfect. You're always going to find things out as you go. So um, build that in. I think that flexibility point, uh, Aliosha, is really key as well, because part of the point of listening to people is to be able to make adjustments in programs as we're going along, as you said. And I think oftentimes there's very rigid uh, rules and restrictions that can prevent that. And I think there's also that point you said about taking donors to a project that's not working well. I feel there's a lot of organizations that are very unwilling to do that because they don't want to look bad because of the fear of the repercussions in terms of financing. I mean, is there something that we can be doing to really have that conversation with donors so they understand that everything's not going to work perfectly all the time? And that, you know, if something goes wrong, it's about learning from those mistakes as opposed to being punished and said, oh, well, you didn't deliver on time or you didn't do what you said you would do in, in the project. Is there something there around those, those kind of donor conversations and, and promoting that within the whole good humanitarian donorship group because they're celebrating their 20th anniversary next year. So maybe we need to be pushing them a little bit on that side. I don't know if you've had any like conversations from IRC's perspective around that. Well, I mean, I did propose at the, I think, I can't remember which ECHO annual conference that I addressed. Um, I did propose a, a sort of, if ECHO had a website where they had, you know, top 10 humanitarian failures and what we've learned from them, it would really send a good signal. Everyone laughed and nobody did anything. So, I mean, you know, that everybody is operating under um, quite tight constraints. Um, I think there's a, you know, this isn't, it, it's not that people working in donor agencies don't know all the stuff that we're talking about here. It's just that the, their incentives and the way that they are held accountable by uh, their polities is, is also uh, limiting, um, uh, limiting their room for maneuver. So I think really, yes, yeah, we can engage in these conversations. I, I've seen, I've, in my times managing programs in, um, in Congo, we absolutely deliberately took donors to um, failing components of projects to have really good conversations with them. And, you know, sometimes it worked and sometimes it backfired, but most of the time it was a, a positive experience for all concerned. And I think that honesty actually helped to build, um, build relationships and ultimately, um, you know, helped further fundraising, which in a world where people do pay attention to um, dollar figures or whatever, then, you know, that also, I mean, you know, in, in a sense worked as a positive feedback loop for the, for the teams concerned as well. So I think, you know, there's, there's a lot you can do, but it, it, again, it's not, there's no linear path. There's no silver bullet. 
Thanks very much. I, I'm sure you've been seeing some of the chats. There's lots of uh, conversations going on. We do have over 300 people online from all over the world. So great that they're engaging. I'm going to try and pull out some of the questions that have come up, not only in the chat, but also in the Q&A so that we can get the panelists to respond to some of those. And then I'm going to turn to the, the room as well in case you've got questions or comments to the panel as well. But some of the things, and I'm going to try and group them because there's far too many, and I'm if I miss any Charles Antoine, that please help me along the way if I, I do find them, I miss them. Um, there were a number of things, I mean, maybe we'll start with a, a simple one, sort of, you know, this issue of language and making it, you know, accessible when we have complaints and feedback mechanisms. Uh, if Eftikar Alam was asking when people from one country take refuge in another country and the language is different, is it possible to establish effective and feedback and complaints mechanisms. And also then, you know, how effective can AAP be carried out in a country in crisis if there is a corrupt government that considers humanitarian organizations as a threat? So how do we work in those sort of challenging environments? And, and then also, you know, what measures have been put in place to ensure that organizations are accountable for their work? with local, um, locals and affected persons. And I think, Alyosha, you, you alluded to the fact that donors can do that, but also within organizations, are there systems that are holding our staff accountable for being accountable to affected populations? It seems like an awful sentence to say it that way, but is it in, you know, in their um, terms of reference, is it in part of performance management? That's the better way to put it. Um, I'm, I'm just gonna go through a few of those and then I'm gonna let you kind of decide which ones you wanna take, but. There's also this issue about uh, linking feedback mechanisms to other accountability mechanisms. Like if you did that link, could you do it and how could that be more impactful? And also what about having other organizations host accountability mechanisms and to ensure that they're followed up instead of just having the organizations doing their own accountability, if, that, if I understood that correctly. So really having sort of an outside organization help hold organizations accountable. On the, on the point of preparedness, um, and now I've lost that question. One second, I'm sorry. Uh, prepared, um, what sort of AP related preparedness actions have you taken in your organizations that could be used as a helpful way to access decision-making for local populations during crises? So what systems have been put in place in advance and how can we make early warning, early action, decision-making processes more accessible so that when we've got crises that may be coming up, we're not taking those decisions as humanitarian organizations, but really involving populations in terms of deciding what early actions need to be taken. I'm maybe going to stop with those ones. There's plenty more, but throw it back to all of you. And I know, Mark, there's a bunch of very particular ones for you on Syria, which I'll come to. But if anybody wants to tackle any of those, I'm going to throw the floor open to see who'd like to go first. Otherwise, I'm just going to ask you one by one. <laughs> but Cece, maybe I can ask you, because you've done a lot on the preparedness size, preparedness side. How are you bringing in that AAP element into those preparedness elements and conversations? Uh, thank you. For the Fijian government, in, uh, with regards to accountability to communities, one of the activities that we normally do, normally do during peacetime is, like I had mentioned earlier, we conduct training. We have partners and CSOs and NGOs that work with us to, to conduct training across uh, islands. For those of you who don't know Fiji, there's, uh, we have over 300 uninhabited islands in Fiji and geographically uh, some of us are very far from each other. Uh, and so community-based disaster risk training manual is one of the methodology where we use uh, to ensure that communities are aware of what to do in an event of a response. There is also communication. I mean, I, I, I see the dialogue is uh, forever evolving around communication. The importance of communicating key messages down to pub, to, to communities that are, um, you know, the ones that are, uh, are our frontliners. Um, Fiji is the 14th country in the world that is at risk of disaster, and we are sandwiched with the first and the third country in the world that are at risk of disaster. So you can imagine how vulnerable we are. 
Uh, and so preparedness for us is an ongoing initiative. Uh, Fiji cyclone season is from November to April, six months, which means the other part of or the other six months when we are not responding to a disaster, we are doing preparedness work. And this means training communities, uh, changing our communication channel, changing the language that we use, working with our partners, our CSOs, to ensure that the work that they are doing are in line with the standard that is set by government. But most importantly, and I'd like to encourage the word partnership, we can't do it alone. Uh, we encourage partnership with our local partners, with our donors, with our development partners to ensure that our communities' needs are addressed uh, both during preparedness as well as during response. Thank you. Thanks very much, Fasisi. Um, maybe I can turn to you, Aisha, around some of those questions about when, because Pakistan is hosting a large number of refugees, obviously, different languages. Is it a challenge to put in place some of those uh, effect, uh, AP mechanisms and complaints and feedback mechanisms? Is it working well or, or are there challenges around that? Uh, you just need to put your mic on. Uh, thanks, Manisha. Like if I, uh, I can share from my experience, uh, uh, while working with like refugees or with local communities where uh, they, they, they use like different kind of language, uh, then like if one or if one organization has system in place that how to respond to feedbacks, the how to respond to complaints, if there is a like uh, a kind of flow chart is there, if uh, everyone in the organization knows uh, that like if some complaints comes in, then what would be the next step? Uh, so then I think it is easier to get it translated. And in our organization, like we make sure that in which area, in whichever area or in whichever community we are working in, uh, like the message given is in, it, in, is in local language. For example, we are working with the Khan refugees. So we do translate messages in the re or in their local language so that they can easily understand it and use the system. Super. Thanks very much, Aisha. Um, Ayliosha, I'm going to come to you because I realize there's also a number of questions around the, the cash point that you raised in terms of, is that the right place? There were some saying, you know, um, when the cash interventions ends, what do people do who were used to cash? You know, that it, it potentially weakens communities and it doesn't strengthen them. And there was, a, if I remember correctly from the chat, there was a specific example in Haiti, I believe, where someone pointed out that cash was actually weakening trying to find it in the the many many um Haiti, yes. yes on haiti it was haiti thank you that it was weakening things i mean how do we make sure that you know cash interventions because i think the point that you made is you know it lets people decide so it is giving them that power to decide how they want to respond to their needs but how do we make sure that it's not undermining their 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 agency and their capacity to to move ahead afterwards thanks so um first of all we can never make sure of anything i think is a really important like the verb or the word ensure should really be struck from the humanitarian vocab it's it's we all of our proposals ensure everything all of the time and it really is quite frustrating um i think look there is no perfect intervention i like i like pushing us to think about when it's appropriate when it's appropriate to to use cash obviously there are some prerequisites um in terms of a functioning uh, market, in terms of um, what the specific needs or vulnerabilities are. It's, there's no point um, uh, thinking that injecting cash into a, a community is going to solve healthcare problems if there is no functioning healthcare service. So that's, that's not, uh, you know, I, this isn't a blind, um, a blind call for cash interventions everywhere all the time, not at all, but it is to... Um, it, what I'm saying is, please, you know, let's check our assumptions uh, before we kind of plow on with something where we overdetermine what we're going to give people and how we're going to do it and then ask them if they're happy with it or not, you know, perhaps down the line um, when we perhaps had an opportunity to just be more uh, to share power quicker and and and, and more directly. Um there are some interesting, there's interesting research going on at the moment um, about, um, so to this point about what happens when cash ends, there's some interesting research going on at the moment about um, the benefit of actually, uh, instead of 
providing, you know, weekly or monthly or whatever payments, actually providing a lump sum uh, at the beginning and no more, and actually using that as an opportunity to provide um, uh, an injection of uh, assets that allow people to, um, again, make more choices, take more initiative. Uh, and again, how, so just to say how you, how you provide cash is obviously also that there are, there are more uh, trusting and more um, uh, beneficial ways of doing it and, and, and less so as well. Do you want me to answer any of the other Quickly, okay, so um, bringing feedback mechanisms in with our other accountability mechanisms. I think, you know, one of, the, one of the kind of hopes, I think, in our case is the use of um, data dashboards to overlay feedback data on indicator data, on expenditure data, on procurement data. We're not there yet, we're getting there. And it's, it is, um, and again, it's not a silver bullet, but it's just a way of raising flags that we can then address through uh, management conversations. On the third party accountability system versus doing it in each organization, I would love a decent third party accountability system, but we have been talking about it for years. So we're getting on with it in the meantime. If someone wants to come up with this and fund it, great. We'll jump at the opportunity to not have to do our own data collection all the time. But if we wait for a system-wide approach, we will be waiting a long time. Um, let me stop there. Did you want to also, and I should have asked you as well, Aisha, in terms of the, how do we hold our staff uh, to make sure that they're actually doing the AAP work? Is that something that is in their terms of reference performance yeah. management? Yeah, so it's built into performance. It's, it's getting more built into performance management. It's built into how we talk about um, our, uh, sort of key principles as um, as staff of the organization it's built into uh, it's getting more built into um, kind of standard hiring questions uh, and interview guidance um, so there's there's ways that we're sort of bringing it in at the front end as well and then it's definitely becoming part of pan, pa, uh, performance management conversations um, but to be honest I, I'm not a great fan of the like fine to use performance uh, review meetings, but these things happen, you know, once a year or maybe twice a year, depending on your organization and depending on how much time people have got and all the rest of it. And it's far more important to bring it into the lifeblood of conversations between, uh, between colleagues and between managers and, and, uh, and their, their staff. And so I think that's also something we're trying to model is how do, how do we from, um, from senior management, bring that into, into conversations and try to kind of model the interest that, that uh, this subject brings to us or has for us as leadership of the organization and how we then hope that sort of trickles down and out. Thanks very much, Alyosha. Mark, I'm gonna to come to you because there were a few specific questions for you and then I'm coming to the room after that. Um, for Mark, if you have any reflections, if any, on the manipulation of aid in Syria, how has it impacted trust between agencies and affected communities? And how, if at all, has it influenced aid strategies? Also, uh, Mina was agreeing with you about accountability as a way of working and a culture that needs to urgently change. As a term and an official definition, AEP is disconnected from our commitments in the grand bargain to see a participation revolution. Revolutions require a power shift and we need to find clear operational ways to shift power away from international organizations and staff towards local networks and communities, which is what they're working on that change in culture in Somalia. So maybe Mark, I know that you've changed a lot in terms of how the, the meetings are being run and bringing in much more local and national organizations, but is that power shift also working towards affected communities in that sense? And then a last one for you, Mark, plus feel free to answer any of the other ones I also had flagged before. Uh, one second. Um, you had talked about, the Mark, you talked about balancing participation of women and men, Syrians and internationals. How about building population proportionate participation of youth in leadership? So Mark, maybe I can hand over to you. Just a few questions, sorry. Um, yeah, no, they're great questions. Thank you. And, and particularly the last point about uh, youth, um, you know, I, I think we do need to engage much more with uh, communities at every level. Um, and that certainly includes youth. And, you know, often they're very 
neglected group. Um, you know, there's a lot of focus on child protection, but even that tends to be largely, you know, focusing on, on children at primary school age and getting those children into school and those kind of child protection issues. Um, the, the youth um, often are very much uh, ignored in our humanitarian work, and yet they, they have a lot to say. Um, they can contribute massively to our thinking and planning, and, and uh, definitely we need to find more ways to include them. Um, I, you know, I, I don't want to, when, when I say we've made some changes and we've got some better gender balance in some of our coordination bodies, I don't want to give the impression that all is well, because it, it's not, you know, um, Syria is a, is a big crisis situation. Um, you know, the, the needs are going up, the, the um, funding and the, you know, the, the, Needs are going up, the aid is going down, and there's a lot of desperation. Um, and uh, so, so you asked about uh, manipulation of aid. I mean, we do constantly have to deal with, you know, the dangers of um, interference in our humanitarian operations and aid diversion. But because this is a, um, a very high risk area, it's a war zone, there are UN listed terrorist organizations that work in this area. We therefore have um, a, a lot of very strong um, risk mitigation uh, measures in place. Um, that's that's a that's a very big um, uh, focus of our of our work. Um, and so, when it comes to risk mitigation, you know, of course, absolutely essential that we prevent any diversion of aid. Um, these feedback mechanisms are very important. And one of the things we do is, um, you know. IOM, for example, when they, when they distribute um, any uh, relief supplies, they go in cartons and the carton has on it, uh, every single carton will have on it a, um, you know, a phone number to call, a WhatsApp number that you can call in different languages, email addresses that you can give feedback. I think we need to find ways to do this much more systematically. Uh, we also have hotlines um, you know, that are used, but in our operation, as in other parts of the world, there are often different agencies have their own hotlines, different clusters have their own hotlines. And I think we need to find ways of, you know, being much more systematic about we use, uh, the way we use those, um, uh, you, um, you know, um, get, get feedback from communities. But ultimately, um, it's not just about getting the feedback. It's, it is about involving them all in all of our thinking and planning um, throughout every uh, phase of the response. And, and I, I'm glad um, someone in the chat has, has mentioned uh, the grand bargain and having a participation revolution. I think a lot of that, a lot of it is about having much more um, participation of these different um, groups. You know, it's not just the youth, it's, it's, uh, it's elderly people, it's people with disabilities. This has all been part of our action plan for change because we are trying to ensure that each of these different groups has um, the ability to contribute. But as I said, some of it comes down to some very basic principles like language. You know, when, when most of our language meetings were in English, it was very difficult for some of those groups to be able to participate. So um, th there are some very basic things that we can do uh, to build trust. And a lot of it is also about, you know, basically just communicating with communities and making that a very two-way communication. Um, it's, it's not just about um, uh, us communicating to them. We need to give them a, a lot more opportunities to, you know, to, to communicate with us. Um, I mean, a lot of very broad uh, themes have been raised today, but um, I'll hand back to you, Manisha, if you have any other specific questions. Thanks very much, Mark. I'm going to actually let those in the room have an opportunity to ask questions because I know there's lots of, it's much easier to sit and type in a, a chat box than it is to be able to get some airtime when you're in a room. Um, I'm going to open up if you just raise your hand, please. And then if anybody's got questions or comments and then just introduce yourself, please. And use your microphone, please. Thank you. Hi, good morning, um, and good morning, panelists. Um, my name is Severin Ray. I'm the, just until recently the head of OCHA office in Lebanon. Um, nice to see you all. Um, special hi to Mark. Um, so um, because the session is on uh, leadership commitment and uh, hearing from you, and I really like and will quote this uh, crowded uh, 
change arena. I think it's another way to say people are very busy, but I do understand uh, the point. Um, and reflecting on some of the points made by Mark and the city as well, um, some of the solutions that you seem to bring up are quite simple in a way. Um, so with the risk of sounding very naive as opposed to very um, uh, you know, cynical, I'm, I'm wondering what are the challenges for the country leadership not to you know, make this happen? Uh, and uh, in line with the discussion, and, um, and thanks also to Charles Antoine for outlining the new ISC principles uh, declaration, how can, you know, is there anything that we should ask principals and donors, like simple steps to, you know, incentivize that it happen, you know, based on this blockage um, that you could a bit highlight in terms of field leadership? Thank you. Thanks very much, Severine. Other questions in the room, please. I'll take a few and then come back to the panel. Thank you. Jen Doherty from ALNAV. So, um, Manishi, you mentioned the power dynamics between the system and local populations. And I was wondering about some of the power dynamics within our own humanitarian organizations. So it's often, you know, frontline staff who are interacting with communities on a daily basis, getting information and feedback and learning from them. But are their voices necessarily the ones that are respected within their organizations? Can they make the change? And what can leadership do to try and help make that linkage so community voices don't get lost in some of our own negative power dynamics? Thanks very much, Jen. Other comments or questions from the room? If not, I'm going to take a few more that, are, that have come up here. Another one is, you know, how, how do humanitarian organizations prove their accountability to affected populations? You know, how do we know that we're doing it right? Uh, there's also this a question around, we seem to mix up a lot of things under the name of AAP. And this is now we're going to get into acronym city. And I don't know what all of these mean, but I think it kind of reflects the point uh, even better that we mix a lot of things up. Mahbub from, who's a CWC, so Communicating with Communities Working Group Coordinator in Cox's Bazaar says, there are so many concepts like communicating with communities, C for D, which is communication for development, I believe, BCC, which is blind carbon copy for me. I have no idea what it means. Anybody? Change, Sorry? Behavior change. Behavior change communication. Thank you. Uh, inclusion, localization, information provision, community engagement, feedback mechanisms, etc. How can we establish some global agreement on common names or titles and standards on all of these issues? And then link to that point around standards, a question also about, and I think Aisha, you touched upon this a bit, but maybe to uh, elaborate a bit more, how helpful do you think the core humanitarian standard and the sphere standards are to approve accountability in practice and how, how helpful are they in terms of supporting leadership as well? Um, just looking to see if there's any other ones that I'm, I'm actually, maybe I'll just let you guys answer those. Uh, anyone want to go first? Mark, if you put your hand up, I can see if you want to go first. Mark, then thank you. <laughs> well, you know, I, I like the first question about, um, you know, saying this seems to be so simple. So, so, so why is it not happening? You know, I do think with, this whole subject of accountability to affected people, um, I think we have made it a bit too complicated. Um, and that's why I don't even like the acronym itself. And uh, I think we, we should you know, try to, 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 to not let it become too complicated. Um, and you know, to me, the, the one dimension that does not really get enough attention is the issue of gender equality. And this is not something that is limited to the humanitarian field, field. This is a global challenge. And it's one of the biggest challenges in the world today, like climate change and you know, some of these environmental issues. It's, it's one of the biggest problems in the world. And a lot of the um, power imbalances stem from the lack of gender equality. And we have massive gender inequality still in the, um, in the humanitarian community, in 
many of the UN agencies in, in much of our, our work. And, you know, I think if we, you know, we're making things too complicated. If we could focus much more on this in issue of gender equality, we would find that we quickly find ourselves much closer to communities. You know, at the moment, it's men who speak for most of these communities. It's men in the humanitarian organizations who are speaking to them. And that's where a lot of the problem is. Um, so, yeah, that was just one of the initial thoughts that I, I wanted to put out there. Thank you. Thanks very much, Mark. Nasiti, please, thank you. Thank you. Just to add on to uh, what Mark had uh, mentioned, um, Thank you, Mark, for covering that. That just took the burden off from me, what I wanted to say next. But um, I also also would like to add, given the locality of Fiji and our vulnerability, it's the, the dynamic of complex emergencies that we are also facing now. The disasters that are facing, um, climate emergencies that we are facing are getting more and more frequent and, more and, and, and communities are getting more and more vulnerable. As we uh, communicate, um, you know, emergency structures, emergency response down to our community, it's different for different disasters. Nobody expected COVID to happen uh, and it did happen. So the, the, the emergency structure that happened for COVID was very different from the normal structure that we do during a natural disaster. So this is adding another layer uh, on top of what Mark had mentioned as to why, you know, it is not as simple, why, you know, it's simple why it's not happening. It's also because of this element that are being thrown to us uh, on, on that on that face, uh, and also just a little bit on on, on gender equality. Um, I, I hate to say this, but I thought I'd also uh, share it. I'm also the first female director for Fiji and DMO, uh, and for you know for small island countries, the importance of peer-to-peer uh, -peer support, the importance of, you know, women supporting women or, you know, groups supporting women so that they can grow. Uh, not only am I the first, I also won the Women, uh, International Women Leadership in DRR 2021, I think, last year. See what COVID has done. So these are the, you know, these are platforms that are there to uh, uh, give women in, in oasis countries, in SIDS countries to grow, to address not all of gender inequality, but at least address some of it. Uh, and some of it is a stepping stone to all of it. Thank you. Thanks very much, Fasiti. And uh, it's great that you're the first woman to be the head of the NDMO, but it's, it's, a, it's a little bit unfortunate, as, as they say, that, you know, there weren't more before you, but congratulations on the award. And that, uh, that a point about peer-to-peer -peer support, I think, is also incredibly important as well. Aisha, can I turn to you for some of those, responding to some of those questions, and then Alyosha? Yeah, sure. Um, here we are talking about like a lot of aspects of accountability. Like, for example, we are talking about inclusion, protection. Then we are also talking about like complaint response mechanism, community engagement, participation, etc. Well, I like as a practitioner uh, and from uh, implementation point of view, I am a big advocate of quality and accountability standards. And I feel that like, uh, if, for example, if I here take the example of sphere or core humanitarian standards, it covers like various aspects of uh, accountability. And if like uh, organization, if systems and policies are enough in place uh, to comply with these standards, I think it, 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 it really improves uh, the quality of work and makes us uh, accountable. Thanks very much, Aisha. Alyosha, do you want to take some of those other questions? Uh, sure. So I guess um, global stuff. Do we need to do we need to have do we need to agree on a common language? Uh, I guess is is one question. I mean, the, a lot of the comments and the chatter about how untranslatable um, various documents and comments are, and I think in a way, again, in, in a naive, simplistic way, perhaps, driving just down to, are we helping people in ways they want to be helped? If not, how can we improve? I mean, you, you, you can create a language and an infrastructure around that that, that can get very complicated very quickly. Um, and, I, and I think that sometimes is a bit of a distraction. On this issue of how we, um, so, okay, assuming simplistic naivete, how do we, we incentivize? Um, I think, 
you know, you, the way I approach that is to look at what people's incentives are now and, and, and what is it that defines success in your role as a, as a leader in a particular geography or a particular sector, and then think about how that is perhaps supportive or a barrier to um, us being, uh, us helping people better. Um, and so it, it's kind of trying to tease that apart a little bit more. And there isn't, a, again, there's not a one size fits all answer to that. But I think that, um, you know, oftentimes we are, uh, we define people as successful if they grow the program or if they, you know, get through a clean, clean audit or whatever it happens to be. And the, the financial imperative can be quite, quite strong in, uh, in organizations. And so I just sort of unpacking that and thinking about what additionally you can use to try and incentivize or um, complement incentives that already exist, but, but reinforce this issue of, of how we're operating seems to be quite fundamental. Um, the question on power dynamics within organizations and staff voices, I think, is absolutely um, spot on and, and quite, um, you know, and whether it's a gender dimension, whether it's a, a, a question of ethnicity or citizenship or language or, or whatever the, the barrier is to, to hearing frontline staff voices or, or the neo-colonial assumptions we all have in our organizations and, and don't even notice whatever those barriers are, uh, they absolutely do need to be challenged if anything is going to go anywhere. Otherwise, it's going to be a very small, quiet conversation that happens at the margins that isn't then heard by the organization and acted upon by the rest of the organization. Um, we did toy with the idea of trying to create some sort of composite um, responsiveness index. So were we, were we listening to staff? Were we listening to uh, communities? And, and we're still sort of toying with that. I, I, I think yeah, I mean, I, jury's out on whether that's a good idea or not, but but um, it, it it seems logical that you can't just think about your organisation in a in a, a sort of unitary way and just look at the relationship between that unit and the outside world. But you have to understand what's going on inside and where the where the barriers are to to hearing voices uh, across the organisation. Thanks very much, Alyosha. And I mean, there was, I'm just looking at some of the comments, uh, a lot of agreement around that link that needs to be made between AAP and gender equality. But also there's a, a comment here around sort of um, on the complexity, maybe there's a disagreement with AAP experts who would disagree that it's been overly complicated. And uh, Fernanda is saying, I sense the root cause is misperceptions that we need to tackle with senior leadership a training which is urgent, perhaps we can call it a senior leadership brief to unpack some of that complexity for those who are not experts. And I think this issue around, you know, there's a lot of emphasis here around leadership commitments cannot be overemphasized and that, you know, organizations really need to communicate clearly with their communities and different stakeholders to increase accountability. I think, you know, we've had lots of different comments and I and think you've all really highlighted the importance of why leadership is so key if we're ever going to really succeed with accountability to affected populations, ideally with a better name at some point, perhaps. But maybe just to come back to all of you for, you know, is there one last thing that you want people to take away, you know, thinking about what is the role of leadership or what as leaders do you want people to remember or, or work on leaving this room today? I don't know who wants to go first. Don't all jump at once. Charles Antoine, please. I think I think what I'm picking up from the, the discussion now that's been really, really good, but I'm, I'm sort of left with a um, half full, half empty kind of uh, feeling because on one hand, I can see some progress. I can see that, you know, excellent to hear Mark uh, shifting the, the, the power dynamics between the, the country leadership and everyone on the panel as well. Lots of good things. But I, part of me is also thinking, you know, there, there's a number of sort of takeaway in my head. One is that, you know, this point, is it not something simple? Why are we not doing it? I think we, we, the reason it's, you know, it's partly not simple because we are over -compli complicating things. There's no doubt on the, the taxonomy, the language around it. I mean, uh, getting fairly frustrated by the fact that we are, as individuals, practitioners who are meant to engage with communities, we're not even able ourselves to come up with a language that makes sense and is simple enough. So, so I think there's, we need to look at ourselves definitely on, on this one. Um, but I think we're also going around the, the real problem. And you know, the reason 
the, the half empty part of the, the situation is probably because we, we are not tackling the, the root problem in some ways. And I think it definitely goes back to this power dynamics uh, point. Uh, I think we look at it from you know doing AP as if it's a series of things you put in place and then job done, as opposed to looking at it from being accountable and comes with that a number of things we, we, which are less comfortable, I guess, for particularly for large organizations to, to be to accept to shift the power. And that goes back to this leadership question. I think what I can see in UNICEF, for instance, is you know you, you have a number of leaders who understand and, and are very supportive, and then changes can happen. Mm. But you also have others who, who are probably more reluctant to, to give up some of these power sources. So I think that the effort should really be on that, uh, probably more than on the technical mm. elements only, or maybe it's a combination of those. And we tend to limit AP, again, sorry for using this acronym, maybe that's the last time forever, but from my side, but, uh, you know, limit it to, you know, let's set up some campaigns and feedback mechanisms and job done and, you know, we move on to something else. It, it's, there's a lot more than that. Thanks very much, Charles Antoine. I realize we've got three minutes left and Mark, I know you need to leave on the dot and I'm hoping we can wrap up quickly. But Mark, can I come to you for like one minute and then a minute, 30 seconds if from each of you, if that's okay. And then I'll wrap up and tell us when the next one is. Mark, please. Well, thank you very much for inviting me to participate because I think this is an incredibly important discussion. Uh, it is hard to, to, to kind of reduce it all to, to, to one or two words. But, you know, if I have to think of the, the key words, to me, this is all about um, respect. It's about trust. It's about dignity. Um, it's about listening. It's about empathy. These are all some of the words I've seen come up in the chat and that a number of you have mentioned. And, uh, you know, I think overall we have to just try to, you know, bring a little bit more humility into this work. Sometimes we're very arrogant. We're very supply driven and top down. And we just need to bring more humility into this work, um, I think. I'll leave it there, thank you. Thanks very much, Mark, and thank you for joining us on the panel if you need to leave. Fasisi, could I come to you maybe? And then Aisha, and then Alyosha. Mark, again, stole my word. It was <laughs> humility, but I probably just, uh, for my last word would be contextualizing leadership. Uh, you know, different countries have different um, leadership role, different countries have different culture. Uh, and therefore, when you do go to this uh, environment, please um, do have the you know the time to understand uh, culture. Do have the time to understand the environment, uh, so that your le leadership is contextualized to the environment. Thank you. Thanks very much, Fasiti. Aisha, please. Um, on accountability, and as leaders, I think we the key for me is to support localized response to empower local organization, local structures. Thanks. Thanks very much, Aisha. Alyosha. Uh, thanks. So I guess um, make it simple, change something, see if it happens. We'll see what happens when you do uh, adapt, keep, keep changing. Uh, don't think of this as a, um, an end state. Think of this as a, a, a commitment, a, a journey that we're on. Thank you. Thank you very much. Alyosha, and huge thanks to our panel. I think you've really highlighted some of the opportunities that you've been able to take advantage of, really the ways that you're putting the, the, the journey towards accountability to affected populations into practice, but also some of the challenges that are there. And I think you've really highlighted the need to work with individuals throughout the organization, really setting the tone from the top making sure that people understand it is a key part of their jobs, but then really working also in that interagency setting so that we're working together, bringing in that gender equality, bringing in that localized, more local participation. And so it's not just such an international system that's coming to bear, but also working with others, you know, to understand how can we, whether we're AP or these different kinds of acronyms out there, we're really putting people at the center. So trying to understand how best can we do that by listening to them and then adjusting what it is that we're doing so that we're not coming in as humanitarian organizations and telling people what is right or wrong, but really trying to make sure that we're following what they identify as the needs. Um, I think you've all summarized it really well, so I'm not going to try to do much more of a summary there. I do want to just flag that we do have a recording of the event. A recording of the event will be made available in video and audio only podcast format at that link up there in the coming days. 
There's also an evaluation survey that we would love you to fill out so that we know how to improve for the next one, which is next week. And there's the link for the survey. It should just take you a couple of minutes. And our next AAP event for during HNPW is on May 19th on Thursday at 10 a.m. Geneva time. So we look forward to having you there. Huge thanks again to all of our panelists and also to our interpreters, our captioners, PHAP, who's been running all the background things, and our CICG, tech, CICG technicians who've been supporting us, and to all of you in the audience here and online. Thank you very much, and have a lovely day, and sorry for being a minute late. Thanks.